Hong Kong protesters are organized. They're strategic. And they mean business. What tactics does a modern protest movement use? Welcome back to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. Joining me today is Hong Kong activist and board member of Amnesty International Hong Kong, Johnson Young. Johnson, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. So I've noticed that the Hong Kong protests have focused a lot on nonviolent tactics. Why is that? Well, first of all, Hong Kong people are quite peaceful, and also nonviolent tactics can help us to galvanize international solidarity and support. Uh, we want to show that Hong Kong people has exhaust every means that we can uh, under the war of law um, to fight for our democracies and our human rights. But it's quite obvious after three months of peaceful protests, after one million, two million people took the street, the Hong Kong government is still uh, not compromising and not making any concession. And this film a lot of hatred and also anger from the population. And most importantly, the police brutality that targets peaceful protesters has um, worsened the situation. Um, that a lot of people now believe that um, that fighting back is the only option. So do you think nonviolent tactics can work? Because it sounds like what you're saying is they haven't. No, um, I think nonviolent tactics is really depending on the uh, contest. I still believe that nonviolent tactics will be useful to galvanize popular support and also galvanize international support. But keep in mind that uh, right now, according to a lot of public survey, actually more than 75% of the Hong Kong people are approving the movement. Um, so we have already achieved that, uh, the goal of uh, governizing popular support. And we have, uh, so right now, uh, I do think that um, in order to keep people on the street, in order to keep pressures over the government, then uh, at least the protesters have to uh, defend themselves well, with minimum of force. Now, I don't think anyone from the protester side would want to uh, use force, but it's quite obvious that if uh, the police was just tear gas or use baton to hit on protesters, there's no way uh, the protester to use shield or um, to use wooden play to protect themselves from uh, uh, the beatings of, of batons. Well, in a leaderless protest like this, how do you enforce nonviolent tactics? I mean, I have seen more than a few Molotov cocktails thrown throughout the course of this. So, you know, I would call it as a leaderful movement because I can see there are actually a lot of leaders who is mm. running different fronts of tactics. Mm. Um, there are people who is uh, working on the international, international advocacy fund. There are people who are gathering supplies that can um, provide supplies to the protesters. So I think this is like a leaderful movement rather than leaderless movement. Now, um, the principles or the, you can say, the uh, culture of the movements was uh, built uh, within the movement. So back to June, there are people who suggest principles like we are not going to separate uh, the uh, moderate side or the radical side of the protesters. We are going to protect each other. We need to prevent uh, uh, shedding blood. Uh, on both sides. So these principles are in general agreed by the um, by the protesters. Now there are uh, of course in every movement there are of course radical flank of people but even people are throwing Molotov uh, cocktail or um, fighting back to the police there are people who suggest that uh, we shouldn't beat people um, indiscriminately and these are the set of principles that are agreed by most of the protesters. And also the way, um, since there is no leading network or leading activist who is calling the shot, so most of the um, disciplines are enforced by the protesters who are on site. So uh, there are of course some scenes which um, some protesters overreact, but um, the other protesters will try to calm them down and de-escalate um, the situation. So these are the mechanisms that are enforced by, by individually, but not by a hierarchy of organization. And to my observation, um, the movement is 100% uh, largely uh, nonviolent, and most of the disciplines are still maintained. It. And uh, the force that is used by the protester are way lower 
than uh, the level of force that is used by the police or state hided FUTs. And I've noticed that humor and art has been a big part of the protest. What does that do? Um, humor and art, it's really useful to maintain the momentum and also the morales of the protesters. Mm -hmm. Imagine that for three months people are living in a very intense period. Uh, for people who are not even protesters, they are under threat of uh, arbitrary arrest or intimidations by police. So having people who is uh, playing music, who is dancing crazily, uh, who is uh, using those laser pen to uh, point at you know, some buildings, that is kind of the humor that people need because it helps to ease their very intense moment um, and it keeps people uh, to um, keep continue their participation in the movement. So that's the first benefits of having humor within the movement. And secondly, humor also, um, you can say, uh, disarm the terrors of the government. So there are several examples. For example, um, the government were trying to um, outlaw the uh, laser pen by claiming laser pen as a weapon and they did arrest people for possessing laser pen. So the other night when uh, the police uh, arrest someone who is possessing a laser pen, people buy a, a thousand more laser pen and they had a, a music show with you know laser pen pointing and everywhere. So this disarmed the uh, uh, government terror and it sent a very clear message saying we are not afraid of your arbitrary arrest. And since then, the government are uh, reducing their numbers of arrests uh, for uh, people who are possessing a laser pen. So that's one example of how we can disarm the terror. One of the reasons why the Umbrella Movement fell in achieving substantial uh, goal, uh, uh, achievement is because we are heavily reliant on tactics of concentrations, meaning people occupying roads near to the government headquarters for 79 days. In the first two weeks of the Umbrella Movement, it was quite effective because the government didn't experience that mass numbers of people occupying main roads. But two weeks after, the government started to adapt these tactics and they know how to uh, plan for counter uh, mobilization and also counter tactics, which is to delay uh, negotiations um, so uh, to and, and weigh things out. And uh, people learn the uh, 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 people learn from this experience that they are going to use more tactics of dispersions, meaning they are dispersing protests in different areas, uh, using guerrilla um, protests in different areas. And it's very helpful in two sense. One, um, the police is uh, face uh, larger barriers in arresting and running up protesters. And second, we bring police brutality and bring, we bring the true colors of the police in front of different neighborhoods. So there are a lot of people who are not in the protest side. But when the police brutality, when the police is uh, arresting people in different neighborhoods, people know the true natures of the regime and they become hardcore supporters of the movements. So it, was, it is really helpful for us to galvanize popular support. And, um, and when people, uh, uh, when residents in different neighborhoods, they were just having a dinner and get stopped and searched by the police, they would, um, they, they will resonate the cause of the movement, which is having an independent inquiry over uh, police brutality. So how do protesters learn about these tactics and how do they organize them? So you can say uh, most of the tactical or strategic discussions are done in Linden, which is like an online forum. Mm -hmm. uh, people have a lot of uh, discussions about what kind of strategy is the most effective. And the algorithms of this online forum, uh, it has the uh, provisions of a like and dislike button. And the algorithm also set in a way that yeah, the more popular threat uh, it is, the, uh, the more visible the threats are. So it becomes a de facto screening mechanism that the most popular strategy will be, uh, will be seen by most of the uh, protesters. Now, we also have the, the Telegram channel, which will build on the foundation of the strategic discussions of Linden, the online forums, and then they will disseminate and coordinate uh, tactics and actions and implementing uh, those actions through Telegram. 
And then lastly, people will post a lot of pictures of police brutality, but also the breaks out of the movement, like people helping each other, like the, uh, and, and disseminate hot and message on social media. So it becomes a feedback loop that help us to slow bore the movement. And that is why, that is the very reason why the movement has become so huge. Mm. Now I understand you were arrested during a protest. Can you tell us a bit about that? So I was arrested late July. I was in Central and arrested by uh, a group of police. At that time I didn't do anything. I was uh, sort of you know, following the instructions of uh, the police, which is you know, uh, stepping back, but still, uh, the police arrest me for obstruction. And when I was arrested, I was punched by the police for several times. Nothing serious uh, compared to other uh, protesters who were beaten by batons and, and pepper spread. Um, and then I, was, I, I spent 47 hours under detention. Um, so during the detentions, um, the police were violating a lot of protocols. So for example, I request uh, uh, calling my lawyers and calling my family members and the, uh, that the police delay it, uh, claiming that uh, they have no capacity, uh, claiming that uh, I need to wait uh, because there were so many people. Um, and also, um, it's quite obvious that police were trying to take away my phone so that they can check the content inside the phone. Mm -hmm. And when, uh, according to the procedures, they should put it in a sealed evidence bag. So no content, no information inside the phone will be contaminated. But when I request them to do so, I was surrounded by several police officer intimidating me, threatening me, uh, threatening to, to knock me in a air, so-called aircraft room. And by aircraft room, what uh, the other police uh, did to other protesters was uh, they have a bucket of cold water, mm. pour it, uh, uh, pour it over the protesters and lock him up in a very cold room as a way to torture people. Yeah, this sounds more like torture than the yeah. rule of law. It's cruel treatment to uh, detainees. Uh, it's not the most serious torture compared to uh, like, because we have report. Uh, MST International also did a report on a uh, torturing case under detention. Uh, it interviewed more than 20 people. More over 85% of the uh, detainees were hospitalized because they were bitten when they were arrested and they were also beaten um, under detentions. There are multiple reports uh, rec uh, documenting uh, fractures of bones or even broken bones um, because four police, five police were locking the detainees in the rooms and then they beat him up. So uh, it has become a phenomenon that uh, the police would use cool treatments uh, on detainees. So luckily in my case, I didn't experience that. And I think part of the reason is because I know the procedures and uh, the, uh, uh, the lawyers also keep and close eyes on me. Um, but I was threatened verbally um, uh, when I was detained. So during those 47 hours of detentions, um, my house was also searched which is something that is uncommon because I was arrested for a very mild crime. But uh, the police, I think they tell lies to the judge and claim I was involved in uh, illegal assembly. Mm -hmm. And the judge signed a warrant for house search. And what was your charge? My, my charge was I was arrested for obstruction, obstructing a police officer. Okay. But when the police apply for a search warrant, they claim I was involved in illegal assembly. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why the judge signed the warrant to the police. And uh, I was arrested along with um, 48 people. Mm -hmm. All of them get a house search. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they did a house search at 10 or even midnight. So it is an intimidation to not just the detainees, but also the family members of detainees. So imagine that the detainees were uh, handcuffed and put a chain on him. And they were taken to their home um, to do a house search. So it is a humiliation, it's an intimidation to family members. Um, and that's how we, uh, we were locked up 
in the 47 in in those 47 hours mm -hmm. um we were also detained in a uh, car park turns into um, so we were locked in a police station car park mm -hmm. turned into a temporary detention center wow uh, there's no good ventilation in there so uh it was really hot it was like 32 degrees celsius and there was no place for us to sleep mm -hmm. um, so some people have to lie on the floor i also witnessed that some protesters and detainees were bitten in the head and they were bleeding and uh, they were not uh, allowed it to uh, send to the hospital four hours or even five hours after they were bitten by the police. So there are, uh, it's evidently that the uh, police deprived the rights of medical assistance of detainees as well. Hmm. And you said you received verbal threats. What kind of threats? So when I request the um, police to uh, seal my phone because I don't want them to take away my phone and contaminate it. I was surrounded by several police officers. They were yelling at me and one of the police officers took his torchlight and pointed to my eyes. Um, so those are the kinds of verbal abuses I experienced. You know, they, they also threatened me to lock me in an air room. Mm -hmm. uh, they threatened um, and saying, well, you know, uh, using a, a, they swear at me, uh, claiming at me as a flu. Um, so those are the verbal abuse I experienced. Mm. What do you think is motivating police officers to act the way, to behave the way they behave? The police are generally hostile to the uh, detainees and also the protester. Mm. Uh, according to the procedure, you know, I was a, I was a suspect. So they can go through the procedures, you know, uh, take a photos, you know, get the evidence. That's all right. Mm -hmm. But it's quite obvious they, that the police officer enjoy verbal abuse or even torturing uh, detainees. Um, and I think it is, uh, there are several reasons why uh, it motivates the police to torture people. First, there is no scrutiny. Supervisor allows them to do so. And second, they hate Potessa because um, Potessa always uh, confront the police because um, the Potessa, they want to express their anger to their government. But the government officials were hiding behind the police and that's why the police feel they are uh, disrespect mm -hmm. and they want to retaliate on the Potessas. So where do you think the protests will go from here? So a lot of people seen the October 1st as end game because you know, the, um, it is the 17th anniversary of uh, the PRC. But I think um, the protest wave would not go away. And there are several reasons. One, the government is not willing to make any concessions. Uh, although the Kerry Lam withdraw the controversial extradition bill, what we experienced in the past 120 days is police brutality. And we also experienced that the bad consequences of lacking a checks and balance system. It is the system that enable police to beat people indiscriminately and arrest people arbitrarily. And what we want is a systematic change because removing one bill is not going to prevent further police brutality in the future. So um, during the first dialogue of Carrie Lam with uh, some of the citizens, she explicitly saying um, she cannot uh, open a independent inquiry over police brutality. And without satisfying this demand, the protest wave is not going, going away. And secondly, more than 75% of the population disapprove the government. Almost half of the population have zero trust to the police and also the government. With such a uh, contentious uh, 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 environment in Hong Kong, a lot of protests will happen or will be, will be triggered in the futures. So even the government would um, employ massive arrests uh, on protesters, more will come. Um, but the sad, the, the sad part of things is 
I do believe that the Chinese government is going to tighten the grips over civil societies of Hong Kong because it, uh, they see Hong Kong as a threat uh, to the legitimacies and also stability of mainland China. So journalists will be intimidated, critical scholars will be dismissed, it. more corporation will be intimidated and they will be forced and asked to dismiss workers who participate in strikes. So in a short one, the Hong Kong Civil Society will experience crackdown. But I guess in the long one, because so many people are not trusting the government and so many people are angry to the government, in the long one, um, the Hong Kong society will continue to fight against the Hong Kong government and also the Chinese government. So you think you'll succeed? I think we will succeed in the long one. But there are also several conditions. First, the global international community will have to stand up against the Chinese government. Second, we have to make more allies um, to most of the uh, liberal democracies and also our neighborhood countries because we are also under uh, bullying of the Chinese government. And thirdly, we, we need to preserve as many human resources as we can. We need to preserve as many activists as we can. That's why we need to build a very strong support network, lawyers network, um, a medical network to support those who are uh, under imminent threat of the government. If we achieve this, um, if we succeed in uh, maintaining this condition, then it will, I think we will win in the long one because there are so many problems in China. At this moment, the state power of this authoritarian regime is strong, but it cannot maintain its state power forever. There are so many internal contradictions in mainland China society as well, like a widening wealth gap, like the young people are also uh, have, they also have a lot of grievances because they cannot climb up to the social letters and, and, and get, a, get a house for themselves. So this kind of internal contradiction would backfire to the Chinese government. And if Hong Kong and also other uh, international community manage to survive, then there will be a lot of opportunities for us to win. So there's certainly a lot that governments around the world can do. But what can people watching this interview, what can they do? In the past few months, uh, Hong Kong movement strategy have been focusing on governizing international support. And there are several ways that individuals can help, like passing legislations and policy in your own government to deter police violence. So for example, in the US, we have been trying to get the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act to pass because it could deter police brutality by threatening, revoking um, the um, special trade status of Hong Kong. And also uh, the US government and also the EU uh, or even Australia, they can consider sanctions individual officers or uh, police commissioners who enable police violence against peaceful citizens. Um, so as an individual, you can call your representatives, you can tell your representatives that in order to not just help Hong Kong people, in order to safeguard uh, democracies and the way of life of democratic institutions, their governments should stand up against um, the Chinese government and Chinese uh, authoritarian regimes. So that's one way people can help. Secondly, um, show solidarity to um, Hong Kong people and also people who are oppressed by the Chinese government like Tibetans and Uyghurs because um, Hong Kong people are uh, morale will need to be maintained if we want to survive the long uh, run uh, oppressions. So having foreigners, having people from around the world to um, share a news of, uh, of Hong Kong to show up to protest, it will help maintain our morale uh, of the movement. And thirdly, uh, enhance um, citizen to citizens exchange and solidarity is also um, very important because what we are talking in here is we need innovative way, we need innovative tactics to continue our struggle. And in order to keep our mind fresh and innovative, 
we have to learn from other country examples. So having this kind of um, citizen to citizens exchange in solidarity will help us to um, keep uh, our action more diversified. Um, and that's the way that we can win. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Stay safe out there. Thank you.